Good afternoon, and thank you for attending this month's Ocean Grand Rounds. Today, we are ecstatic to come back from our hiatus and have Dr. Deborah Cohen of Oregon Health and Science University and Dr. Samuel Edwards of the Portland VA Healthcare System and OHSU present on burnout in primary care, results from Evidence Now. Dr. Deborah Cohen is a professor and vice chair of research in the Department of Family Medicine at Oregon Health and Science University. She is an expert in qualitative and mixed methods research with more than 20 years of experience and has spent more than a decade studying primary care practices with a focus on clinician patient communication, practice implementation, change and improvement, and health information technology use. Dr. Cohen has been a principal investigator on several federal and foundation funded grants and is currently the principal investigator for Escalates, the mixed methods national evaluation of ARC's Evidence Now initiative, aiming to improve heart health in 1,500 small and medium sized primary care practices across the United States. Dr. Samuel Edwards is a primary care physician, general internist, and health services researcher at the Veteran Affairs Portland Healthcare System and an assistant professor of medicine and a research adjunct assistant professor of family medicine at Oregon Health and Science University. Dr. Edwards' research focuses on understanding and improving the practice of primary care, which has included work on evaluations of large scale primary care quality improvement programs, implementation of interprofessional education in primary care, and primary care interventions for medically and socially complex populations. This session will be recorded. Attendees are muted upon entry, but if you are not, please mute your microphones and pose your questions through the chat box. This will last approximately 45 minutes with 10 to 15 minutes at the end to answer any questions you may have. We will now pass the mic and share the screen to Drs. Deborah Cohen and Samuel Edwards for Burnout in Primary Care, Results from Evidence Now. Dr. Edwards, you are ready to share your screen. Great, Sam, I can see it. This is Deb. I'm going to kick us off. Thank you for that really lovely introduction and, and thank you for the invitation, frankly. Um, we're really glad to be here. I'm going to orient you to the Evidence Now initiative um, and tell you a little bit about the practices that are participating in this initiative. And I'm going to do that relatively quickly because I think Sam has done a tremendous job and has a lot of interesting results to share with you about burnout. Sam is advancing the slides, so I think we can go to the next slide. So Evidence Now was an initiative funded by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality almost five years ago. And um, they, the intent of the RFA they put out was to um, fund regional um, cooperatives, if you will, that's what they call them, to um, rapidly disseminate and implement um, capacity improving and cardiovascular disease preventive care improving um, changes to a very large number of practices. So our funded seven regions that we're gonna probably refer to as cooperatives, and those regions spanned seven states, 12 states, and Oregon was one of those states, um, along with, you can see Washington and Idaho and the five boroughs of New York. Each of those um, regions engaged about 200 primary care practices in evidence now. So we have between 1,500 and 1,700 practices that participated in this initiative. And that number varies in, in depending on what we're looking at, what outcome we're looking at, and what data sources we're using. Um, so it reached about 5,000 providers, and we estimate about um, 8 million patients. So it was a very large scale initiative, and it is, um, I think another part of ARC's efforts to implement what has been called a primary care extension, which was an unfunded mandate um, of the ACA reform. Next slide, please. Here you can see the regions. 
Um, what this shows you more or less is that some of these were single state regions and some of these were multi-state regions. And it gives you an idea of who the, who the partners were. And of course, one of them was the five boroughs of New York. And the dots more or less represent the distribution of, of practices in, in each of those regions. Next slide. So we were funded to do the national evaluation of evidence now. And um, we conducted a, um, well, first of all, let me take a step back. Um, here's what, this slide shows you what the, um, each cooperative did, what kind of implementation support each cooperative provided to their practices. And that um, included facilitation, um, engaging practices in learning collaboratives, providing expert consultation, um, assisting practices with HIT, more or less to focus on audit and feedback and, and performance benchmarking, and then giving practices feedback on performance. Next slide, please. We were selected to um, conduct national evaluation, and um, our tasks were as follows. First, we wanted to understand what was um, the level of cardiovascular preventive care at baseline. And there were four measures that we looked at that aligned with the CMS measures for aspirin management, blood pressure control, uh, cholesterol management, and smoking cessation. Um, and we were tasked with conducting a prospective observational analysis to really try to understand what were the most effective combinations of interventions for improving capacity and improving ABCS, and how did context, both at the practice level and at the regional level, um, affect the, um, what we were observing. In addition, we were, ta we were um, tasked with using um, qualitative methods to really understand how and why did some of these combinations work, and how were some um, more or less effective, and we are very close to being done with all of the analytical work to answer those questions. So we really um, collected some data at the national level. We collected some data at the regional level. And at the practice level, what Sam is gonna talk with you about today, we had quite a bit of practice level data that allowed us to understand um, baseline characteristics of the practice, as well as what the practice was exposed to in terms of dose of facilitation. And one of the characteristics that we were tracking was provider burnout, in, in part because that we felt was important to measure, in part because if you were working with um, a practice that had a lot of um, physicians and, and clinical staff that were burned out, it may be harder to make change in those practices. And, and that was something that we just wanted to monitor. Another possibility was that this intervention itself could cause burnout. And um, so we wanted to, to keep track of that. So I'm gonna give you a quick overview of what the evidence now practices looked like. The focus in evidence now was on targeting practices that had fewer than 10 clinicians and no internal source of quality improvement. Um, so you'll see that our sample tilts towards um, the, the solo smaller practice, but you can see that they were largely urban, that despite that, we had a good group of rural practices um, and a number of practices that were classified as serving medically underserved areas. We also, as I was saying, have more, a, a large number of solo and um, two to five clinician practices in our sample. Um, and a number, 40% of our sample um, is clinician owned. Um, so you can, you can see um, that we've got, and you can see we've got uh, about 20% or 22% are health system owned or hospital system owned. And so we've got a good varied sample. Next slide. I think I think this is my last slide, actually. So this shows you the outcome measures that we were focused on, aspirin use, blood pressure control, cholesterol management, smoking cessation, and also practice capacity. And we had two measures of practice capacity in evidence now. The first was adaptive reserve, which you're gonna hear a little about, a bit about today from Sam. Adaptive reserve is, a, um, an, is, a, is measured by, it measures facilitative leadership, 
practice culture, ability to communicate, mindfulness, and, and, and it gives you a picture of the practice's culture, and it's filled out by um, ideally a, a large number of people or at least a representative group of people in the practice, so it's filled out by the individual. We also assess um, practice capacity for doing quality improvement, which we won't talk about much today, but that survey was completed by one person on behalf of the practice to give us a feel for what kinds of quality improving strategies was the practice using at baseline and what changes did they make as a result of participating in evidence now. Take it away, Sam. Great, thank you, Dr. Cohen. And uh, thanks, uh, William, for inviting us to speak. This is an exciting chance to sort of synthesize and share some of our findings here. So <clears throat> I'm going to step back and talk a little bit more broadly about burnout. Um, so there's a new diagnosis in a society marked by rapid social and technological change. Sort of we're seeing an accelerated pace of life, new forms of communication, transport, media. We see a new diagnosis emerge, a functional disease of the nervous system, driven by the symptoms of depression, insomnia, and weakness. It's often seen in professional classes, so businessmen, lawyers, and scientists. So it sounds a little bit like burnout, but what I'm talking about here, oh, is neurasthenia. So this was a diagnosis developed by George Beard, who is a neurologist in Connecticut in 1881. He described this condition as being similar to a drained battery, so being exhausted. And I, I, I point this out only because, you know, when we think about the emergence of, of burnout and these sort of, um, sort of medical terms uh, being applied, we should really think about the sort of societal context in which they're um, coming out. So here Beard is talking about the transition from sort of an agrarian to an industrial society at the end of the 19th century, you know, rapid urbanization and the technology he really focused on here, um, you know, was the telegraph. Um, so society was changing and, and people seemed to be experiencing it in their work life in a way that drove symptoms. So just keep in mind that this, this story has been, been told in different ways before. So that brings us to the question, what is burnout, right? So it, it's, it's this sort of evocative, self-defining term, right? We imagine a flame going out. There's no more fuel, no more fire left. We all know what it feels like to be sort of uh, potent and generating heat and light and then suddenly to be, to be stopped. And we know that it's a negative mental state and it's kind of caused by work, but I'd say most people, have, that's their sort of general understanding of it, but it's, it's kind of hard to tease apart. So I, I kind of put these bubbles up to say, well, are we talking about work environment? So is it the climate of the work environment? Is it sort of people's morale, sort of cohesiveness of the work team, how well a team functions? Or is this really an individual experience of stress, depression, fatigue, being unsatisfied at work? And like, how, how are these tied together? Um, and that's really the crux of trying to figure out what this burnout syndrome is. Um, so this really emerged in the academic literature in the mid 70s. So the paper that was really um, decided as sort of coining this term is from a psychiatrist named Herbert Freudenberger. Um, he worked at a free clinic in um, East Village, New York City, working with um, patients suffering with complications of chronic drug use. And he actually heard his patients using this term to describe the effects of chronic drug use. But he thought it was very apt to, to describe the experience of the people working in the clinic, where he saw people becoming emotionally depleted, becoming unmotivated, and sort of losing their commitment to try to help these people um, just because of the work was so hard. The papers he wrote on this were very qualitative and autobiographical, so he sort of experienced burnout and described his sort of personal journey through trying to cope with these emotions um, while helping these very vulnerable people. Um, sort of simultaneously, um, a psychologist um, named Christina Maslach at the University of California, Berkeley was doing a study of social workers. Um, sort of social work had sort of um, grown a lot in the 1970s and she noticed her subjects describing themselves as burned out. And she noticed that they were emotionally exhausted, 
um, developing negative perceptions about their clients and experiencing a crisis of professional competence. So a very similar chain of experiences in the similar professions, so sort of caring professions, working with vulnerable people, um, experiencing this combination of exhaustion, um, depersonalization, and um, losing a sense of competence. So uh, she and, and uh, Jackson sort of codified this concept of occupational burnout in 1981, developing a tool called the Maslach Burnout Inventory. And this definition is really what's used most commonly in the literature now. So it's a, it's a psychological response to occupational stressors characterized by emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and a reduced feeling of effectiveness. And the idea that this is sort of a, a causal pathway where first you get exhausted by work, you start to depersonalize both the people you're working for and the people you're working with, and then finally you feel sort of impotent, like nothing you do really matters. Um, so this, as I said, this, she developed a survey, it's 22 items, it's kind of become the gold standard. They're not completely, there are a number of measures of burnout in use, um, but this is one most people turn to. Initially, it was actually really written for the caring profession, so social workers, teachers, nurses, and a lot of the questions are about how you care for others. So they actually had to sort of change and expand the tool in order to look at other professions. But um, as Maslach's team did this, research expanded and we started to discover burnout in lots of different professions. So lots more um, research, lots more prevalence. And then as I said, other tools developed to measure burnout in different contexts and this, this sort of um, research area grew over time. Uh, this paper, so this is fast forwarding a lot in time, um, is probably the paper in which physician burnout really caught sort of national attention. So this is from Tate Shanafelt and colleagues at, at Mayo. Um, so they sent a survey to like a national sample of physicians in the American Medical Association master file, 26% response rate, so not great, but that's a, that's a tough survey to do. Um, and then the, the sort of headline finding from this paper is that 45.8% of physicians reported at least one symptom of burnout using the Maslach burnout inventory. Um, highest rates among family medicine, general internal medicine, and emergency medicine. So this is sort of like frontline clinicians doing undifferentiated care, sort of broad scope. Um, and then more recently, this was in a, a survey of family physicians uh, administered during the recertification process. This is actually a 100% response rate. Um, so they reported 24.5% uh, burnout, but this is using quite a very different measure. So they're not exactly comparable. This is a common problem in the burnout literature, but still very prevalent. Um, moving into federally qualified health centers, so certainly um, important for um, OCHIN. This was a study of the um, federally qualified health center uh, advanced primary care practice demonstration, um, sort of a modest increase from 23 to 31% um, using the same measures. So um, a prevalent problem, in primary care may be getting worse. So lots of studies show the negative consequences of burnout um, associated with lower quality of care measures, um, decreased patient safety, increased medical errors, associated with lower patient satisfaction, and then lots of evidence that it drives employee turnover. So people going to part-time, people quitting. A recent estimate that physician burnout costs around $5 billion a year in the United States um, just the cost of replacing physicians is very high. Um, a couple of things to highlight about previous work is that it, it's often limited to a single profession. In healthcare, it's most typically physicians or nurses. Um, and the other members of primary care practices are not included. And then it's not really thought about as a practice or organization level phenomenon. It really focuses on the individuals, um, which just kind of comes from the definition of, of burnout, whether it's a organization problem or an individual problem. So a couple other policy features you guys are likely familiar with, also with the passage of the Affordable Care Act, there were a lot of efforts to try to um, sort of improve uh, primary care um, through the patient-centered medical home model. So sort of a team-based technology enabled um, quality improvement um, approach to improving the quality of primary care. 
um, through the High Tech Act, there were a lot of incentives to adopt electronic health records at scale, which has happened. Um, and then just more broadly, the idea of using quality measurement, improvement methods, and often linking to payment as a way to sort of improve care. So in primary care, a lot of policy shifts in the US you know, that makes us think maybe we need to sort of reevaluate burnout. So in evidence now, obviously, this is just a, a huge sample of practices um, that care for a lot of people in settings that are not typically researched. So um, just some important basic questions to ask. So what's the prevalence of burnout in evidence now? What are the practice and individual characteristics associated with burnout? Um, and then the second, is, this, is it a really a characteristic of practices or the individuals within them? And then what's the relationship to sort of the practice culture and burnout? And then finally, and sort of briefly, you know, how does burnout change over time in evidence now practices? So first we'll take on the first one, just sort of what's the prevalence and what, you know, what's correlated with burnout and evidence now. So as Dr. Cohen mentioned, we surveys are sort of a key data collection tool in evidence now. So um, the co-op seven cooperatives administered surveys to all their enrolled practices before evidence now began, immediately after it ended, and then six months after it ended. Um, there were two surveys. One was a the practice survey was given to a single sort of practice leader that collected um, some organizational characteristics like the size of the practice, ownership, location, uh, participation, and other transformation initiatives and EHR capabilities. But then, and sort of powerfully, they actually surveyed every member of every practice. Um, so they reported on their job type, how long they worked there, um, how many hours per week, and then uh, burnout. So the measure of burnout we used is here. So it, the question was overall based on your definition of burnout, how would you rate your level of burnout? Um, five level response. So the one being, I enjoy my work, I have no symptoms of burnout. And then the top being, I feel completely burned out and often wonder if I can go on. I'm at the point where I may need some changes or may need to seek some sort of help. So quite a spectrum. Um, so we dichotomize this into not burnt out and burned out as others have done in the literature. Um, and getting back to Maslow, it's worth noting that this measure correlates very well with the emotional exhaustion scale of the Maslow burnout inventory, but not so much the other um, measures. So this is a good measure of one of the dimensions of Maslow's burnout. Um, so of the 1,716 practices enrolled in evidence now, um, almost 1,500 um, gave us practice surveys. And then 1,367 practices had at least one member that filled out the member survey. So you put these together, about 1,350 practices had both a practice survey and a practice member survey. So 78% response rate, which is excellent. And then you can see our sample of, of members is really high. So we had a 10,000 practice members, approximately 7.5 members for the practice. So this is a within practice response rate. So the number of practice members have responded uh, 67%. So those of you who have done survey research probably know that this, these kinds of response rates are very difficult to achieve. So a lot of credit to the cooperatives and their hard work here, um, but also allows us to say that this is a very representative sample. Um, compared to, say, some other uh, burnout research. So this just shows that the report, uh, the proportion of um, different team members that reported burnout. So overall, we saw about 21% of all surveyed members reported burnout. But we see this is higher among physicians, so just about 26%, which is consistent with what we saw in the family physician survey. Um, nurse practitioners a little bit less, um, clinical staff members a little bit less, and then non-clinical staff members sort of notably below the mean. So it seems sort of like the, you know, more, more clinical care was associated with more burnout, but notable that all of these, you know, are pretty substantial amount of burnout, um, you know, suggesting it may be a sort of practice level phenomenon. In terms of correlates of burnout, at the individual level, we saw that being in practice for, in that practice for more than three years was associated with burnout and then working more than 40 hours per week. 
At the practice level, larger practices had more burnout than solo practices. So health system and hospital owned practices and federally qualified health centers had more burnout than independently owned practices. And then any practice that said they participated in an accountable care organization um, had more burnout. Some sort of notable non-significant findings. So <clears throat> being located in a medically underserved area was not associated with burnout and neither was the number of patients seen in the clinic per clinician per day. So sort of practice level measure of volume, no association at all. So we put this together using um, a framework that at Maslock has, has used, um, sort of based on some stuff from social determination theory, which is from um, Desi and Ryan, University of Rochester. So thinking about, um, in this case, autonomy, workload, and relatedness as sort of things that drive uh, burnout. So clearly, um, people want to be uh, autonomous at work and have control um, over their work environment. And we did see that, you know, solo practice, where we would assume that practitioners and, and their staff have a lot more control over how the practice works, was associated with lower burnout, while external ownership um, was associated with more burnout, as was a participating in an ACO. So an accountable care organization is a, so a Medicare program where um, uh, groups of practices are responsible for quality measures. Um, and perhaps that the fact that a group may not be able to set those measures or control that could be a, a sign of less autonomy. Uh, for workload, we saw a little bit of a mixed picture. So we saw at the individual level that more hours per week and longer time in practice was associated with more uh, burnout, but then the number of patients per day, and then being located in an underserved area, which could potentially be a marker for sort of a higher workload, were not associated with burnout. So it suggests that workload, there might be a more um, complex relationship, you know, perhaps in a highly autonomous environment where you choose to work a lot. Um, workload is not necessarily associated with burnout, but in an environment with less autonomy, um, that's different. And then relatedness, finally. So a sense of community and practice where people share goals and trust. Um, we might imagine in a smaller practice environment that's more um, common while in a sort of an externally owned um, practice that may be less true. Um, all right, so now I'm gonna shift a little bit to our analysis looking at um, whether burnout is a characteristic of practices or the individuals within them. Um, so, and then secondarily, what's the relationship between practice culture and burnout? So to do this, we also looked at our baseline surveys, um, but instead of using the entire sample, we decided to focus on practices that had at least one clinician, one clinical staff member, and one non-clinical staff member respond and that had at least a 50% response rate at the practice level. Because we really wanted to understand whether there was agreement around burnout in the practice. So are these practices everyone burned out and everyone really happy? Or is there this big split between different kinds of employees? Um, and to try to understand from sort of an intervention standpoint, you know, how are we best able to, to help practices? Um, do we need to be operating at the practice level or the individual level or both? Um, so to do this, we sort of compared uh, the variance in burnout um, within and between practices. Um, we and then we described burnout at the practice level, and then we compared practice level measures of culture. So Dr. Cohen mentioned the adaptive reserve um, in both sort of high and low burnout practices to try to understand the relationship better. So first to just look at um, the relationship uh, between, in, within a practice, how, how much agreement there is in burnout. We use two different measures. So these are called interclass correlations. So the ICC-1 is typically understood as the proportion of total variation, in this case of burnout, that can be explained by being part of a particular practice. Um, also known as a reliability associated with a single assessment as being the same as the group mean. So if you've got one person's burnout measure in a practice, how close is that to the mean measure of burnout at the practice level? 
And the scale of this, so something like a 0.01 is considered very small, so there's almost no group effect. A 0.1 is sort of a medium effect, and a 0.5, 0.25 is a large effect. So we saw a 0.104. So this is kind of right in the middle. So there's definitely evidence that this both has a practice level influence and an individual level influence. Um, similarly, the ICC2 is a different interclass correlation. This is the reliability of the group mean. This point six also puts us somewhere in the middle of the scale where it's fairly reliable, but um, both of these measures point to the idea that burnout is both, both has practice level influencers and individual level influencers. This just shows the distribution of practice level burnout. So this is the proportion um, of practice members who are burned out on the x-axis and then the number of practices on the y-axis. So you can see on the bottom, it goes from zero to 100. Um, so the mean here is 18.6. So almost 20% of practice members reported burnout, right? This is similar to our other look. Um, but interestingly, when you look at the distribution, so the 25th percentile is 0% burnout. So 214 practices in our evidence now sample has no burnout, no one reported any burnout, which you know, for someone like myself who practices primary care, it's kind of hard to imagine, but encouraging. Um, so we just sort of decided to look at that as sort of a low burnout group um, to try to understand you know, what's going on in that sort of bright spot. Um, alternatively, uh, practices with over 40% of members being burnout, we define as a high burnout group. Um, so this is sort of the tail of this distribution. So we decided to look at sort of some of our measures of practice culture between the zero burnout group and the high burnout group to kind of accentuate the differences to see, you know, what really drives the differences there. So as Dr. Cohen mentioned, the adaptive reserves is a measure of practice capacity for organizational learning and development. Um, it was developed um, sort of psychometrically through the patient Centered medical home national demonstration project. Um, and it's a practice level measure. Um, it includes domains such as relationship infrastructure, facilitative leadership, sense making, teamwork, um, work environment, and culture of learning. Um, so what we did here is this is the odd, so it's a, it's, a, it's a scale where there's a statement and you say whether you agree with it or not. So we took the strongly agree or agree with this statement and then looked at the odds of, of those statements being true in a practice with zero burnout versus high burnout. So um, we rank these in terms of the, the AR domains that were most important. So by far the most important domain was facilitative leadership. So here are two items. Practice leadership promotes an environment that is an enjoyable place to work and leadership in this practice creates an environment where things can be accomplished. Have odds ratios between six and seven. So. Um, you know, from a research perspective, these are very high odds ratios. So these are very strong relationships. So leadership is important with burnout. Um, second was the work environment domain. So I think that one of the key things to notice here is that when we ask people about burnout, they're, at, they're reporting their own individual experience of burnout. And here they're assessing whether the, the practice is a place of joy and hope and whether most of the people in the practice seem to enjoy their work. So this is the, uh, an individual respondent linking the sort of practice environment to their own experience of burnout. And also these are very, very strong relationships. So odds ratios, you know, 5.76 and 6.12. And then with the confidence intervals, these are, you know, extremely significant. Um, next, teamwork. So people in this practice um, operate as a real team. Um, sense making, when we experience a problem in the practice, we make a serious effort to figure out what's really going on. Uh, culture of learning, so this practice learns from its mistakes. And then finally, psychological safety, which is not technically part of the adaptive reserve measure, but we added a, a question specifically about psychological safety. So the measure here is uh, members of this practice are able to bring up problems and tough issues. Also a very strong relationship with an odds ratio of, of 3.29. So these are just some selection of the AR domains to, to highlight some of the most important domains, but it's important to know that they're all really significant. So adaptive reserve um, practice capacity is critical 
um, in the experience of burnout, which is um, you know, perhaps uh, not surprising, but we think an important finding. So to summarize from this analysis, you know, we, burnout is both a practice and an individual level problem. And as such, interventions are probably gonna need to take both on. Um, but practice culture, you know, as measured by adaptive reserve is highly correlated with burnout um, as the domains uh, I, I highlighted show. Um, and that's, you know, probably where we really should be focusing a lot of our, our intervention efforts. Um, and I just bring this up because I just, just saw this paper from our colleague Ben Crabtree and Millbank, um, a, another large evaluation of a, of a primary care improvement program, but they did a really nice job of picking apart um, sort of what strong leadership looks like in small primary care practices and sort of practically how to think through that and cultivate it. So I would um, the point people towards this paper if they want to think more about leadership as a, you know, sort of as a target for intervention. And finally, I'll just show you the, the trends of burnout over time in evidence now. We haven't done a lot of analysis here. We hope to get a chance to dig deeper into this. Um, but, you know, how is burnout changing over time in evidence now? And how does that um, compare to other um, primary care settings? And is there evidence that the work um, impacted burnout? So we just included all the practices with survey data at all three administrations. And the data here are just the proportion of practice members that reported burnout. So the same measure we looked at in the last analysis. And this is just descriptive. There's no p-values or, or trend lines, really. So here we just see the proportion of practices burnout at each time point. So 17.9% um, at the pre-intervention time, 20.7 at the end, and then 26 months later. So um, this is a pretty subtle change. And I, I don't have the citations up here, but I can tell you if you look at um, some of the big Medicare demonstration projects, um, MAPCP, CPC plus, we see similar things. So these sort of small, or the, the Veterans Administration, um, small increases of burnout over time, kind of unclear if they're related to the intervention work or not, since there's obviously so much going on at the same time. Interesting um, sort of stratified analysis here. So we looked at, you know, since we saw in our initial analysis that solo practices and external ownership were such strong predictors, we thought we'd look at the trends across these groups to see the differences. And, you know, in general, we just see that these um, ownership categories are still very strong predictors over time. So we see that group practices are more burned out than solo practices and clinician-owned practices are less burned out than non-clinician-owned practices, but kind of at a similar amount over time. So these aren't really changing. Um, really remarkable how much less burnout we see in solo practices. But, all right, so I'll, I'll attempt to summarize everything I've shown so far. So we saw through evidence now that burnout is lower in solo um, independently owned practices, not participated in, in ACOs, which we think really highlights the importance of practice autonomy um, and relatedness in practices. Um, we saw that patient volume and location were not really located not related to burnout. So while workload is important in burnout, I think in the right context, in a very highly motivated, um, you know, autonomous practice, workload is less of an issue. Um, we learned that burnout is both a practice and an individual level construct. So we definitely need practice or organization level interventions in addition to sort of individual level interventions. And this hugely strong association with adaptive reserves so that you know, cult practice culture is probably a lot more important than structure. So we saw examples of very low burnout practices that were in big group settings and in solo settings. So that's a real place for intervention focus. And then we see this modest increase in burnout over time. So we don't think we see a lot of strong evidence that, ev that evidence now is improving burnout, nor is it making it worse. But getting back to sort of societal influences and context around burnout and the way we think about sort of satisfaction in the workplace, you know, I think I wonder how much are we dealing with a sort of a broader issue. Um, we are certainly in a time of rapid technological change, um, and you know, sort of just thinking 
at a larger scale about what what might be driving driving these trends. So I just want to thank our our team. I've been very fortunate to be a part of this and learned so much from everyone here, um, including Dr. Cohen. And, and thank you, William, for giving us the opportunity to present. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Cohen and Dr. Edwards, for that fantastic presentation. And thank you to everyone who attended today's session. Be sure to follow Escalates on Twitter at, at @escalates.org and check out their website at escalates.org and also check out OHU, OHSU Family Medicine on Twitter at, at OHSU Family Med and the Portland VA at, at VA Portland. And be sure to follow Ochin on Twitter at, at Ochin Inc. and over on LinkedIn. In addition, be sure to head over to ochin.org and advancecollaborative.org to read the latest on our research studies, blog posts, and upcoming events. And be sure to stay tuned for next month's Ocean Grand Rounds as we welcome Rebecca Levinson and Lisa James from Futures Without Violence as they present on strategies to address intimate partner violence. Invitations will go out two weeks prior to the event. So from all of us at Ocean and from Dr. Cohen, Dr. Edwards, and the whole Escalates team to all of you out there, have a great weekend and please stay safe out there. <laughs>